In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and one God. Amen. Thank you for joining us on our last session uh, as we conclude the study of First Epistle of, of St. Peter. Today we're going to go through the rest of chapter 5. Last time we were on uh, verse 2, um, and now we're going to conclude uh, with the rest of the chapter. And so if you remember from verse 2, um, St. Peter was addressing the, the elders, the priests, the, uh, the bishops of the, of, the, of the churches, and he was saying that they shouldn't serve as bishops by necessity or compulsion, uh, not serving the brethren by dragging their feet, in other words, but voluntarily and willingly, according to God, because God has appointed them to that service, and they should take the blessings of that. Um, and he goes on to say in verse 3, uh, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So um, he, he goes on to say uh, that they should not lord over those who are being assigned to them or being re who are responsible for them, um, insisting that they be the ones who are honored, right? Instead, they must prove themselves by being examples for the flock, walking in humility. And so St. Peter has to remember what our Lord has said to him on the night that he was betrayed, that if he wants, um, that if the disciples wanted to be blessed, they have to wash each other's feet. I think that's where this is coming from. And in verse four, he says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. It's an incentive, right? It's a, it's a beautiful promise. St. Peter and his hearers should remember that when the chief shepherd, Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, he who is the true shepherd of, of his flock, has been revealed at his second coming, they will receive back the unfading crown of glory. And so St. Peter is saying, let them, um, let them exhaust themselves. Let them be fully focused on service uh, for their brethren right now, laboring in humility. Why? Because they will receive their wages soon enough. The, the crown of glory that Christ gives is unfading like his kingdom. And that is the reward that he will give to the faithful stewards of his flock. And it is Christ, not the children of men, that the shepherds are, are truly sh are serving. So it should give them that focus that we're not serving mere men, we're serving Christ himself. And so after addressing the elders, St. Peter now addresses the young people in verse five. He says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So after addressing the elders or the presbyters, um, St. Peter rounds things off by addressing the younger ones. And so as the leaders have responsibility to their, to their charge, so likewise, the younger ones also have responsibility to the elders, in particular of being submitted to them and following their leadership. You know, maybe it seems that the younger members of the church are being tempted to reject the authority of their leaders, and St. Peter urges them to, to godly submission. And not just th that, but like all in the church must clothe themselves with humility toward one another. The, the word being translated for, for being clothed with humility, clothed, is a rare word, a rare word in Greek. Um, and it's used to describe a vestment that's tied on, um, like a servant's apron. So they're being encouraged to put on humility over all of their other virtues, so to speak, as like an apron that's tied over their tunic. And so this imagery points to us to the idea that they, can, that they can now work and stay clean through this humility. And they're striving for humility and mutual service. You know, they can, they can be encouraged knowing that, that God opposes the arrogant, those who refuse to submit to humility, but he gives grace to the humble. If they will gird on, if they will put on, if they will vest with humility, God will reward them even now with his grace and favor. And so therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Since God gives grace to the humble, as we just read in verse five, St. Peter exhorts his hearers to be humbled, therefore that God may exalt them at the appointed time. And this self-humbling refers to their voluntary acceptance of persecution and their refusal to oppose against God and, or abandon him. If they will do this, God will exalt them at the appointed time at the last judgment. Now, they may be victims, 
but then they will be victors. And this is because God, under whose mighty hand and providence and judgment they submit, is able to overthrow the kingdoms of men and give the kingdom to his own people. In verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So it's this humble acceptance of persecution, no matter, it's not by force. Uh, St. Peter is not forcing his hearers to um, endure persecution. He's saying he wants them to humbly accept it for they see the big picture. Rather, they can, you know, it's, it can be a peaceful uh, acceptance in the midst of persecution, throwing all their worry, all their care upon God, because it is a concern uh, to God about them. So the image of uh, casting or throwing is a, is a very nice picture. So instead of clutching onto their own anxiety over themselves and their families in times of persecution, they can throw it away, right? They can cast it away and give it to God. Um, and God is not indifferent to their pains and sorrows. He will care for him, for them too. And that's a beautiful promise. In verse 8, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It's a very uh, strong imagery. So St. Peter is saying God's care for them in this age doesn't mean they can be careless. Yes, God, it's a very clear promise that God will care for them, but don't be careless. They must be sober in spirit. They must keep alert to spiritual dangers. Um, they must be clear-headed. Because their opponent, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking someone to swallow up. The image of a lion on the prowl, roaring in hunger, just waiting for a victim to come by so that he can swallow them up in one gulp. You know, their pagan neighbors may be doing the persecuting, but their true opponent is the devil. And we all have to remember this. And he is looking for Christians who are careless. Um, those Christians whose composure during persecution might even take them to the core and shake them into even denying Christ, that, that the devil might even devour them. They must therefore withstand the devil, being solid in their faith, immovable in their commitment to Christ. Um, the, the word being used for vigilant or, or to withstand, it describes not a passive resist, a resistance, but an active opposition. So Christians are to withstand Satan during times of persecution by boldly confessing Christ before all men, and they must be glad to suffer and die for him. And in verse 9, resist him, the devil, um, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So it will be easier uh, to do this knowing that the same sufferings are, being, are, are happening by their brotherhood, basically all other Christians who are in the world. The Christians in Asia Minor are not being singled out or picked on for such treatment. Theirs is, is um, the entirety of the Christians worldwide and the fate of all disciples of Christ in this age. And they're not alone, even to this day. In verse 10, but may the grace of God, uh, may, sorry, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, uh, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So St. Peter concludes this exhortation by enduring, um, about enduring the fire of this living age uh, with a final doxology and final praise. God is praised because at the end, he will be revealed as the God of all grace, the one whose ways with his people are as mercy. He called them into his eternal glory in Christ, calling them into baptism to share Christ's glory in the age to come. Until then, they must suffer in this age, but that is only for a little while compared to the eternal age in which they will bask in the light of God's love. So after, they have, uh, after we have suffered throughout this age, God himself will restore and establish and strengthen and, and, and uh, settle us, found us in his kingdom. He will restore us and mend us. The, the word used to restore, um, to perfect, is, to, like, is um, like mending the nets. So he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. He will establish and strengthen us, nurturing us back to full strength after this exhausting uh, time on this earth. 
and he will settle us. He will be a foundation for us, making us firm so that we won't be overthrown. No wonder St. Peter assigns all might and all glory even to the end of ages. He is the Almighty who does whatever he pleases for the salvation of his own people, and, and we should truly give praise for that. By Silvanus, in verse 12, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. So after having finished his letter, um, St. Peter adds a few final greetings. He mentions uh, St. Paul's friend and companion, Silvanus, known as Silas. Um, it's through him that St. Peter has written this epistle and that Silvanus um, served as even the possible carrier of the epistle. And since Sylvanus, uh, since we suggested, uh, he may have had a share in the actual wording of this epistle, as we mentioned in the very beginning of the study. St. Peter commends him as a faithful brother to assure everyone that he endorses all that was written. And the letter itself is St. Peter's exhortation and witness to the true grace of God. And so St. Peter is telling them how to receive God's grace and salvation. How? By living a righteous life being steadfast in the faith. And so let them therefore stand in it and not be moved or shaken from the grace in which they now stand. In verse 13, she who is in Babylon elect together with you greets you and so does Mark my son. And so St. Peter writes from Rome and he uses the word Babylon for its... Um, its representation of sinfulness in the Jewish eyes. And so he sends greetings from the church there and who is, she is co-chosen along with the churches of Asia Minor to whom he is writing. So, you know, churches were usually uh, referred to in the feminine uh, since the church is the bride of Christ. And so St. Peter's, uh, we also see that St. Peter mentions his spiritual son, Mark, who sends his greetings too. St. Mark was also in Rome at that time. And he later on, we know, um, wrote down the stories uh, uh, of Jesus and published them as the Gospel of St. Mark. And, and we conclude here in verse 14. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Uh, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so St. Saint, uh, Saint Peter concludes by bidding them to greet one another with a kiss of love. The standard Christian greeting of peace that seals the liturgical prayers because he, ex he expects this letter to be read in the liturgical assembly. And he adds his own greeting of peace to them all. And, and so we end there. And so we conclude our study of First Peter. And we want to thank you all who participated uh, from the beginning and, and went through the study. And we pray that it was beneficial to you all. Um, we ask for your prayers. And we hope that we have more opportunities to study the scripture with you all in the future, hopefully in person. Uh, thank you again for your time and for your patience with these videos. And, and, and God be with you all. And glory be to God forever. Amen.